Hello, and welcome to this CUBE conversation. I'm Shelley Kramer, Managing Director of Principal Analyst here at the CUBE Research, and I'm joined today by Andrew Joyner, who's the CEO, and Mayur Pillay, who's the Head of Hyper AI at HyperScience. Gentlemen, it's been about three months since we last connected, and I know that you've had some amazing growth in that time period, and that there are some exciting things afoot as well, perhaps a new product launch, and I would love to talk more about some of these highlights. Andrew, welcome. Meyer, welcome. Let's walk through some of the news. Thank you, Shelley. Happy to be back on the Cube. Uh, it has been a busy couple of three months for hyperscience. Look, I think we're following the broader macro trend. There's a lot of excitement around AI, uh, and we're following that trend. We just posted some of our best growth results we've had in our history, so we're excited about the growth. But behind that growth are some product announcements, some leadership recognition from some of the leading analyst firms. Uh, we were achieved a leadership status with Forrester and IDC who are covering our market in different terms, one document mining and the other are called IDP. Uh, but we're excited for those leadership recognition nods and we're excited about the growth we have with our customers overall. Uh, we also then just announced, and which is why Meyer Pillay has joined me, uh, the launch of our Hypercell for Gen AI, which is an exciting new product for us uh, to extend what we've been doing in the hyper automation market. Exciting times indeed. So, of course, it's safe to say that hyperscience is making it all happen. And, you know, Gen AI, it's the buzzword of the year. I'd love to know more about Hypercell for Gen AI. So let's dive in there. Well, let's start with what the core premise of hyperscience is about. So yeah. what we solved is a very technically difficult problem, which is we use models to essentially read human-friendly information. And that's really the opposite of generative AI. Generative AI uses very powerful frontier models to generate prose and human-friendly information. But we've always gone at the inverse. And so what problem does that solve? Well, we're able to access very complex mission-critical documents that are embedded in the core of the enterprise. And frankly, most of the stuff has not been automated by businesses. Well, once we started reading that information with high fluency, and now we've been automating and really taking out a lot of business process outsourcing that's had to occur in businesses, we realize that this is really valuable data. This is the stuff that businesses run on. This is purchase orders and invoices and statements. And so this information is actually the information that's not sitting in the frontier models. And so we're now providing that bridge. Our hypercell for Gen AI is providing that bridge of this mission critical data and putting it now in the hands of the users of these frontier models. And that unlocks a whole new potential and a whole new opportunity for our business. Very exciting. Very exciting. Mayor, you want to pop in here and share a little bit about your thinking on this front? Uh, sure. And, and great to be here, Shelley. Thank you for thank you for having us. Um, so yeah, you know, as as kind of Andrew said, there's there's so much fascination around Gen AI and and LLMs, and we, you know we're really starting to see organizations move from experimentation into starting to open up budgets and you know across and you know, open up budgets and and move across budgets um, for for figuring out how to how to how to use LLMs and Gen AI within the core of the enterprise and at scale. And so, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've we've really done here is we've started to partner with um, some of the large software companies, Google Cloud, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, um, to be able to provide a, a kind of an end-to-end -end AI development platform that customers can use to bring in all of this proprietary enterprise data, but bring it bring it in a way where it's accurate, where it's labeled, and it's ready to be used by by AI systems, and then actually you know deliver Gen AI experiences that are that are grounded um, in the language of the business. So we're really excited about that. Our partners are really excited about it. Um, so it's a really a, it's a great time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and data is everything these days, isn't it? So I'd love to explore a little bit about what you're seeing happening in the industry as it relates to Gen AI adoption. You know, our research shows that the interest is high, the adoption is somewhat low. I mean, most organizations are kind of in some early stages trying to get arms around all kinds of things, guardrails, compliance, that sort of thing. And it can be a little bit scary, but I'd love to hear more about what you see going on in the industry with your customers as it relates to Gen AI adoption, maybe some of the challenges your customers are seeing. And then, of course, how hyperscience is helping pave the way for making Gen AI adoption less scary, much easier. You bet. So, Shelly, I'll take the opportunity and then, Meyer, maybe you take the challenges. So, 
the opportunity that we see is vast because this is mission critical data that's embedded that really they run their businesses on. And we're able to eliminate a lot of friction that's inside the companies so we have a provable ROI that we can deliver back to the enterprise. And that's been missing from the generative AI conversation. There's yeah. been a lot of experimentation. I think people has captured the fascination and imagination, but actually proving ROI has been elusive. And so hyperscience has cracked that with our approach. We're able to actually eliminate a lot of back office process and demonstrate hard ROI whether it's the elimination of some labor that's not needed from an outsourcing perspective or just an upgrade on the technology side. So that provable ROI, I think it's what's fueling some of our results. Yeah. So that's an important part of the first part of the conversation. But now delivering this for the second part, which is to power generative AI experiences is hard. I think Meyer can talk through the challenges both at the compute stack with our partners, at the model stack, and then the data stack. So, Myra, why don't you set up the challenges that we see our customers facing today? Yeah, sure. So, so we were, uh, you know, we were actually at we were at HPE Discover um, uh, last week or, or two weeks ago, and and um, you know what we're hearing the industry kind of coalesce around is is the importance of of data um, as the lifeblood of of AI. And when you think right. about like really how what it looks like to deploy AI within the enterprise, especially generative AI applications, there's kind of three. As Andrew alluded to, there's kind of three stacks. There's the compute stack, there's the model stack, and then there's the data stack. And a lot of large software companies are investing heavily in the compute stack, in the model stack. Um, you know, hardware is really hot right now. I think you know. Companies like HPE can't sell enough, uh, you know, GPU units and <laughs> servers, and and um, you know they're they're facing kind of delays and shortages as well. Yeah. So um, so that's you know that's a that's a, a big area of investment, a big area of orchestration when it comes to you know being able to manage these inference workloads and 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 manage the the compute required here. Um, on the model stack side, you of course have all the foundation models um, that have been developed. You know the multi billion parameter models. Um, but while that's all that's really complex, you also have there's a lot of complexity complexity in the data stack, and that is getting all of your data ready for for to actually be used by AI um, AI applications. We heard a term from um, from Jensen uh, Jensen, the CEO of N Nvidia, yeah, kind of calling it corporate intelligence to digital intelligence, and that being a really big step and big stage in in really operationalizing these experiences for for the enterprise. So, you know, the the area that we're really impacting is is helping organizations get that that accurate labeled data estate that could then kind of fund and power um, grounded experiences, especially for mission critical operations or mission critical generative applications. You know, I, I believe very much that of course the model stack is important as is the compute stack, but it's that data stack. That's it. That's the Holy grail. And you have to get arms around structured and unstructured data. And, you know, as you mentioned, data is absolutely the lifeblood of every business. And I think it's also actually also a business's competitive advantage today. I mean, regardless of the size of your business, knowing how to collect and manage and extracting sites from your data is really critical. Well, there are two elements to it, Shelley, to build upon what you just touched on. You know, one element is this data is complex. It's messy, yeah. right? The, what, yeah. what you run your businesses on, you know, we get banking statements and they span across pages and there's embedded information about whether you bought securities or traded securities. When you fill out mortgage applications, there's a lot of information and income verification that you attach it. So this is messy stuff that's right. at the core of the businesses. But businesses are also really afraid to send that out into the cloud in an ungoverned fashion. So governance. Yeah trustworthiness, traceability of this information, those are now added elements in the AI universe that are really important to address. And that's what hyperscience has always done from the very beginning. We sold very deeply into heavily regulated industries. We can actually run on premise, so we can run in air-gapped environments. And we've always shown the predictions of our models. We've always shown the traceability to our ground truth data. And that gives customers the comfort. You know, We're working with the Social Security Administration fueling our big business results with one of the largest awards to a software vendor, over $80 million, sole sourced uh, to hyperscience through Accenture from the SSA. And what are we doing there? Well, there's a lot of sensitive information. There's a lot of duplicative information that goes around the social security, but it touches all of our citizens. And this information essentially needs to be redacted. It needs to be secured. It obviously can't leak out. This is you know people's earnings history and so forth. These are complex forms right. and remittances that come in. 
And that information is secured, but now we can actually now turn that into an advantage. So now we can use that information for predictive models. We can use it to power generative experiences. So in our dealings with the SSA over time, that will get a lot simpler. And so we're building some of these customer use cases. Myra, I know recently you got a pilot with a public safety company that I think is an interesting one. Who would think the police department would be excited around the hypercell for Gen AI? But why don't you share that use case as well? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So yeah, it, it, it is, it's is—it's an exciting engagement. And and really, you know, we're looking at, you know, at law enforcement use cases, you know, where you kind of, you're getting all of these, these reports and records that come in, and a lot of them are scanned, a lot of them are messy, a lot of them are kind of uh, difficult to interpret. So, um, you know, typically you'll have, you know, investigators that are going through and kind of manually looking at that information, entering it into a system. Um, but what's really interesting is that beyond just the automating of that, of that data process, the extraction of that data, um, what Hypercell for Gen AI is able to do alongside, you know, some of our partners is we can build a RAG architecture, we can build, uh, you know, a generative AI experience that allows that department to actually query or chat with that data um, to understand relationships across several reports or several data sources. So, like, you know, a good example could be, um, you know, you get a report in and you're and you're um, and you want to know if the if the uh, if the if the person in the report uh, violated their parole. Right, and that's a perfect example of a, of like crunching that can be done through gener through a generative application and a foundation model, um, but does require accurate data, does require machine readable data in order to ground that system and and actually um, you know um, provide value in that use case. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I know that hyperscience takes what you call a, a human-friendly approach when it comes to Gen AI. I'd love to know more about what that means because that's attractive to me. <laughs> Good. Well, look, there's a lot of human-friendly information that we have to deal with as a business. Mm -hmm. uh, often that human-friendly information comes to make sure it's like a receipt. So you have verification you purchased or a passport so you can cross borders. So that's mm -hmm. human-friendly information. That's always been hard for machines to process at scale because it's so varied. It has a lot of context to it. So we train models, first off, to read human-friendly information. But then we also need to do this with high, high accuracy. And so we train models over time, they may not be exactly confident that they have all of the information they've read correctly. So what we do is we introduce this notion, it's now common in AI, called human in the loop. And what that allows us to do is build consensus that we're looking and translating and transcripting that information in a highly accurate fashion. It's this now new notion of a machine and a human working in collaboration. So yeah. the model now does 98% of the work. It's accurate a lot of the time. But when it's not so sure, it can raise its hand. And yeah. what it does is when it raises its hands, it sends it over to a human to essentially provide consensus on whether it's correct. And if it's correct, it continues to build its confidence and it will send less to the human. And so it's this natural interplay between the actual machines and the models and the humans that are deriving really world-class results. Typically, you didn't have that. At the end of the day, you might say, okay, our, our machine ran, how many errors did I get? And what we find is, I'll take you through an example. So Amazon, we're a big customer of Amazon. We use AWS for some of our cloud services. Yeah. But interestingly, we help Amazon onboard all of their truck drivers. So they have 275,000 truck drivers. It's a high turnover business. So there's a lot of documentation and process that comes in on an annual basis. You have to submit the valid driver's license, right? That's basics. But then you also need to check, we don't want unsafe drivers on the road. So do they have criminal records? Do they have driving records? Do they have proper insurance? There's a lot of documentation that comes in. We need to automate that process as much as possible. And so this is something that hyperscience can hyper automate. We can take all that information, orchestrate the actual onboarding of these drivers. And then to Meyer's point, what we can also then do from a human friendly perspective is do so with high accuracy, and then we can turn that into predictive models. So we know at the time you onboard a new driver, whether that is actually adding any type of un uh, unsafety to the actual roads that everyone's delivering these packages on. So this is a great example of where we're taking our core technology, hyper automating a process, and then turning it into advantage where we can start to predict whether packages or there's drivers that are unsafe on the roads. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think, you know, going back to the human friendly discussion that we just had, one of the things that I find 
attractive about that is that, you know, we are battling perceptions about Gen AI on numerous fronts. One is internal and concern about AI taking my job and everything else. And so, and, and then customers, oh, we're using AI. Can we trust it? Is our data safe? That sort of thing. So I love the way that you describe that because not only do I feel like, you know, having that human in the loop um, speaking to the fact that this is not just a technology solution. This is about people, processes, and technology, and they all work together to deliver this measurable ROI that you're talking about. And I think that that allows an organization to build trust and confidence in users and customers. And I think that's really an important part of this equation. Well, there's so much talk around, is AI going to take over the human race? And I don't think right. that's the case. We see the collaboration as an important calculation, but we also shouldn't shy away from the fact that there is labor savings. But yeah. the type of task that hyperscience is eliminating inside of a business, they're not strategically or competitively helpful. So these are tasks that we like to say we're putting the human back into work because yeah. these are not tasks if you had to do all day. They're highly repetitive and they're things that AI is very good at eliminating. And this allows those workers to elevate inside the organization at the VA there were over 14,000 keyers who were keying over 1 billion documents a year that were flowing through the VA. It's one of our largest customers. And what hyperscience has been able to do in our partnership with IBM is essentially hyper-automate that process. So we now read every third-party documentation that flows into the VA. It's complex medical information. And this is a pretty important constituency. So the VA would staff this pretty heavily to try to get through the claims process. It's tedious work though, over 14,000 keyers manually keying it. And the fastest the humans could get that done is three months. So if you're an important constituent, nine and a half million veterans, that's a long time to get feedback on some of your claims. We're now doing it in three days and we've automated it in 98% uh, automation. And all of those keyers have been able to free up and do other productive things for the Veterans Administration. So yeah. it's a wonderful study that not only are we helping our veterans process and get critical help much more quickly, but we're also freeing up that labor from those tedious tasks to do higher potential things yeah. for the Veterans Administration. Yeah, it really is in a, in the most simple terms. It's a transformational time for human productivity. And, you know, I think that's incredibly exciting. It's funny, I was just at showing my husband who works for a Fortune 100 company and who is in sales and I was showing him um, you know, what a Gen AI model can do. And, you know, I asked him in advance, I said, are you familiar with Gen AI? I mean, is it something you're using? He's like, yeah, I'm sure it's being used within the organization, but it's not really something that I'm touching at this point in time. So I said, come watch this for a minute. And I, and I showed him how I was able to create um, a document using Gen AI. And he was just like, absolutely gobsmacked. So I do think it's a transformational time. It's an exciting time, but it's also a scary time. And, you know, I touched on this earlier. So share with me, if you would, you know, what advice do you have for organizations who, who want to embark upon this, who want to get beyond just the thinking about and evaluating stage and who want to dive in on AI initiatives? Where do they start? So I think it's rare that a technology comes along as fast and as transformative as generative AI yeah. uh, came across. You know, the adoption of generative AI to 100 million was faster than pr pretty much any other type of technology. So this has happened at a pace, but it is absolutely, you're absolutely correct. It has captured everyone's imagination. But it's also a little bit scary because it's fast, because it's yeah. happening outside of the borders of your company. This notion of how do I participate in this transformative technology. For us, it can write code, not just documents. So we can actually write the code to power your applications. Yeah. Uh, it's actually writing and, and can and hallucinate. Uh, it can write things that maybe didn't occur. So these are scary premises. What hyperscience is, I think, a part of is grounding these systems in the truth of your enterprise data. And so I think while we've captured the industry and it's happened very quickly, there is a light at the end of the tunnel of we can ground these architectures in the language of your business and do some really transformative things without that risk, without your information going beyond your borders, without a, you know potentially your IP leaking out into the use of these frontier models. 
Meyer, maybe you have some other additional things if you've talked to our customers that you also want to share that are the tips and techniques other than just the speed and the grounding of these models. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I think kind of going back to there being a lot of experimentation and now kind of moving to where, you know, where can you really start to see ROI with, um, with generative, you know, generative AI and, and AI in general is there's a lot of, a lot of kind of mission critical core applications um, that can benefit from whether it's copilot experiences or, um, you know, or unstructured data insight experiences, which seem to be pretty ripe for, um, for, for a place to start from a use case perspective. And I think the other thing too, is I, and Shelly, you had mentioned a bit about kind of like the, the worry about replacement and human involvement. Yeah. Um, and, and I kind of, you know, what we're, what we're seeing is it is, it is very much like kind of a, um, kind of a, a like a, an assistant, right. Yeah. And, or an agent is, it's kind of how these models and, and how these applications are working, where they're helping people do work better, more efficiently, faster, um, you know, being able to crunch uh, data that wasn't able, that you weren't able to crunch before. So I think kind of maintaining that human in the loop um, mindset, maintaining that kind of co-pilot mindset um, is a way to kind of also ease kind of some of the, some of the the concerns and risks um, associated with just having a fully, you know, a fully autonomous um, foundation model running your, running your enterprise. Yeah. Shelly, you know, who's not uh, happy at the moment, this is kind of a cont contrarian take, are data scientists. They're really busy. And where they're really not happy is their data that they want to build. They want to work on algorithms. They want to make these great experiences and they're stuck labeling all this data. You know, ultimately what goes into AI, it has to be trained by a human. We have to teach it uh, the language of these businesses and we got a fast start with all this public data. But Thank now you. the data scientists who want to leverage this, it's a really hard thing. They have to go and label this data. Again, that's a problem. Hyperscience is helping them solve. We can help speed up the labeling of all that information and teaching right. it these core information documents. But that's one constituent that I do hear about who is really busy, who is stuck at all ends of the spectrum. They have a unique yeah. skill set, but it's challenged. Their time is challenged in these days. Yeah, and by the way, I have uh, I have twin eighteen year olds heading to college in the fall, and um, I can't even tell you how many they're not focusing on data science, but I can't tell you how many young people are focusing on that particular area of study today, and you know for obvious reasons, right? It's a full platform shift. So yeah. I think what our children exactly will learn in school, it's, it's a different, it's a different time and it's a different skill set. But I think it's a really exciting time. Uh, yeah, you it get is. to reimagine all of the software, everything we use on a daily basis can be reimagined. And I think that's what's so exciting about this time. And I would just encourage more, I'm more optimistic. I would encourage businesses to lean in to the generative capabilities. Yeah. I think, you know, as I like to say, it's that that AI will replace humans, but AI will certainly replace the humans that don't use AI. It's going to replace those workers for sure. So you right. need to incorporate AI. And I think businesses that use AI will replace the businesses that don't. Uh, so I think right. they need to lean into it. And I think this is a transformative time and exciting time for all of us. Yeah, I agree. Well, and some of the ways that I try to phrase this when I'm talking about this, when I'm talking certainly with customers about this is that, you know, for those of us who are old enough to have to have experienced the advent of the internet and to have worked in the corporate world before the internet became a thing. And then I, and then I remember, you know, I'll never forget the, you know, the day I got my first um, a Mac on my desk. And the only thing I used my, the only thing I really used the internet for was email. And, you know, of course I created documents and things like that, but I really wasn't, you know, connecting in any, any meaningful way. And then you look at how quickly that evolved and how quickly our lives changed as a result of the internet and the power of that connectivity and all of that sort of thing. And so, you know, when I explain it in that way, it's like, and this is an equally transformative moment. Business as we know it is going to be forever changed. And that's something to be, you know, really be excited about. So I, when I talk to people about that, they kind of see it and then they kind of understand that leaning in is really an important thing. It is. It's going to be a busy time for consultants because as Meyer and I see, we see about an average at our enterprise clients of about 60 to 80 generative projects that they've spun up. So there's all across an organization, everyone can reimagine that component of their business being impacted by these generative yeah. technologies. But which one do you prioritize? I think ultimately the ones that can generate real ROI and yeah. uh, have a real impact are the ones that will rise to the top. 
but I think you're, this is a very exciting time, but it's somewhat chaotic because companies, yeah. they're just not organized yet. Their data state's not necessarily in order. Which frontier models do you use? What's the right compute stack? But there's some really smart companies that are all working on this. I hope HyperScience is considered one of them. Yeah. And that will hopefully unleash the potential of what I think I agree with you is a yeah. great technology. Yeah, very exciting for sure. So we touched on this earlier, but I'd love to take a bit of a deeper dive on HyperSelf or Gen AI. What's unique about it? Sure. Yeah. So so really, you know, kind of going back to to our core premise, um, you know, on the on what we're doing on the on the end-to-end -end automation side is HyperScience took a machine learning approach to, to being able to read and understand complex information, documents, um, text-based assets. So, you know, we, we've kind of, so out of the box, you know, we're shipping pre-trained models. We're shipping the ability to also custom train models without data scientists, without code, um, to really build a really performant engine of just being able to get the data off of these complex documents. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, uh, is, you know, we've really, we've really kind of pioneered the the meshing of machine learning and human in the loop to kind of orchestrate a system that where you can control accuracy. So, you know, especially for these mission critical use cases, um, claims processing, KYC and account servicing, right, where data quality is really important and underlying systems can get corrupted if that data, if that data is inaccurate, you know, we're able to kind of orchestrate uh, the, the date, the accuracy of the data output. And then that also comes with this kind of automated labeling. And then I think the last thing on, 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 on HyperSelf for Gen AI is that we've kind of wrapped all of this in a really turnkey, easy to deploy um, infrastructure. You know, we're seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of companies um, and organizations that are trying to piece a lot of this together, you know, with API calls, different microservices, yeah. um, and really in, alongside our partners, what we've kind of designed is a pretty elegant way to orchestrate an entire end-to-end -end system, kind of pull in different pieces that you need to, even if they're from different companies, but more so, especially within hyperscience, um, do so in an accurate, uh, trustworthy, transparent way. I think for a lot of customers, that turnkey business is very compelling because, you know, and I, I'm a huge believer, whether it relates to Gen AI or a lot of the things that are happening in the world of technology today. And, and you mentioned some of the, the partnerships and alliances that you've already formed. I'm sure there are more of those in the works, but the reality of it is today, best in class is usually a combination of working with the best, most trusted vendors to make something happen as opposed to reinventing the wheel yourself. And, you know, so many challenges for that lack of skilled talent, the cost involved to do it, you know, build something from the ground up and all of that stuff. So I see turnkey as being an incredibly compelling part of your value proposition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, yeah, so we have, you know, and I, I think that to the partner point, you know, we're definitely, you know, we're, we're trying to work with, you know, the partners that are leading the industry that are investing heavily um, in in trying to help organizations kind of bring this to life um, in a in a way that's easy, uh, in a way that's um, trustworthy, and that's also in a, in a way that um, kind of makes sense for them. So yeah. that's yeah, obviously your point on on the partner side. It's kind of how we're how we're thinking about our partnerships as well, yeah. and then kind of the value that we're bringing um, to to our partners. Got it. Well, in addition to, to covering all things data and AI, I also cover the security sector. And so I think it's important to note hyperscience can be deployed on-prem, in a private cloud, as SaaS. And, and as you can see from the examples that we've talked about, the Veterans Administration, the Social Security Administration, obviously, if you're able to work with government entities, you know, high-grade security um, capabilities, Seems to be a given, am I right? Well, we just got listed with our partner Palantir for the Fed Start program. Yeah. Uh, the Fed Pro Start program is the off ramp for Fed Ramp certification, which is one of the yeah. highest security certifications. So we've always treated the security of our systems, the security of our customers' data, uh, as a preeminent thought in the design of our systems. We were from the very beginning were able to deploy our models not connected to the cloud. And that was a very hard technical feat, but we knew we were connected to sensitive information embedded in the enterprise. These are the things you run your business. This is some of the most sensitive information that you have. And so we knew we have to treat it and access it in a thoughtful way, but it goes beyond that because we allow you in a turnkey fashion to train. So you don't have to be a data scientist to teach our models the unique language of your business. So you can show up with unique documents on unique workflows and teach it to our system. 
But what we do that's different than the frontier models is we show you exactly what you've trained the models on, your ground truth data. That was a novel approach that is not often used even today. Uh, we allow you to see the predictions at any step. So when we suggest what we read, we can show you why we read it in that way. And so when you get into complex things like signatures and handwriting, all of that transparency and traceability is important. And I think the future generative use cases where you actually have patient advice that's being given, transparency into why it gave you that prescription or diagnosis is really important in the traceability. You can't do that with frontier models. And so I think the world will advance where the security and the trustworthiness, the transparency, also the ethical handling of this information and the ethical handling of the training of the models. These are all new terms that are new. You know, it's not just about building a perimeter. And hyperscience has really designed itself from the beginning uh, to solve this. And so I think it is important uh, and it is it is critical in the in the world that we that we live in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know you've disrupted some of the legacy OCR vendors who rely on rules-based templates that have AI bolted on top of them. I know that you've shared some key highlights with you know some customer stories. I know you, again you mentioned the Department of Veterans Affairs, Social Security Administration, um, your partnership with Google Cloud and HPE. Any other highlights you want to share with us? One of the things that I think is most exciting that people, it's counterintuitive that we're actually disrupting that I'd love to share is I actually think what hyperscience represents is the future of BPO. So yes, we disrupted legacy OCR technologies, but frankly, those technologies didn't work that well. They've had 20 years to build them and they're just not that good at human-friendly information. That The information is too varied, it's too complex and writing rules and prescriptive zone pixel density, it just did not work. So that was easy for AI to disrupt. It's much harder to disrupt all the tasks that humans are doing because they're doing them because machines couldn't. And so now we're taking on that premise. And if you look at it, the BPO industry is 540 billion. It's way bigger than these classic legacy enterprise software markets. And that's because this stuff hasn't worked that well. Yeah. And so I think the controversy will take is, is how much of that can we automate? And then how much of that can we turn all that productivity into an advantage, like the hypercell for Gen AI? Because if people can start to build future experiences that benefit their customers and employees, not just the back office, then that's a pretty important technology that we're serving to enterprises. And we're just getting started. I think all of this is just getting started. And I think that's the most exciting thing for hyperscience. Well, I agree. I'm so happy to hear about the success you and the team at Hyperscience are having and the successes your customers are having. I mean, that's really what it's all about. So Andrew Joyner and Meyer Pillay, thanks so much for joining me on theCUBE today. I can promise you, I very much look forward to continuing to watch what's ahead for Hyperscience. And um, based on the things that you've shared today, I know there is no way you will disappoint. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's been Shelly, great. we'll be back anytime you'll have us. Thank you for having us. We really uh, enjoyed the conversation and look forward yeah. to sharing more in the future. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, to our viewing and listening audience, I'm Shelly Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst at the Cube Research. Thank you so much for joining us on the Cube, your source for enterprise and emerging tech.